From the Lean Enterprise Institute in Boston, this is the WLEI Podcast, where we share stories of people making the world better through lean thinking and practice. For more information about LEI, including how we can help you apply lean thinking, please visit lean.org. The long-term success of companies like Danaher, Fortive, Herman Miller, Parker Hannafin, and many others have all validated the power of lean thinking and practice. But if that's the case, why aren't there more exemplars? And why do so many companies either intentionally misconstrue lean or fail to realize its full promise over time? Join me in three stars of the lean universe as we dive deep into this fundamental question. Welcome to uh, today's episode of WLEI, the LEI podcast. I'm your host, Tom Ehrenfeld, and today I have the great privilege and honor to have three lean legends on our broadcast. We have Jim Womack, founder of LEI. We have Art Byrne, veteran lean practitioner and author of the Lean Turnaround and the Lean Turnaround Fieldbook. And today we have Mark Deluzio, another lean legend. And his recent book is called Flatlined, Why Lean Transformations Fail and What to Do About It. Okay, well, uh, the first chapter just kind of talks about why companies have flatlined. And uh, let me read a a few things here that we kind of listed out. Uh, Seasoned executives are perplexed as to why the lean efforts are now flatlining. And by the way, flatlining is a uh, word, why I called it that was because every time a CEO would call me and say, we've been doing lean for 10 years. And, you know, they always use that word flatline. We've been flatlined, right? So I said, that's a good name for a book, right? So anyway. These are the types of problems I'm seeing most often from talking with senior leaders in mature companies who seek my counsel. They do not understand that a lean transformation is more than just a cost reduction program. They typically view lean as a manufacturing convention that does not apply to the rest of the business. They insist on running and structuring the organization with a traditional 1970s mindset. They believe that the fundamentals of lean do not or cannot apply to their business. They become confused by lean consulting zealots promoting the latest product or service and tempted to move away from the basics of lean. They feel to look at themselves critically when evaluating the reason for their flatlined performance. They are consistently being shown only one benchmark, Toyota, with little appreciation for the successes of brownfield companies have had in their journey towards excellence. Sometimes it's hard to see something that already that clear, clearly when you are in the thick of things. As much as possible, it's going to be important to step back and try to examine your own leadership and what's happening in your company objectively. So I'll stop there, but then the, the, the main reasons that I listed and, and I go into in detail into the book are uh, why companies flatline is one and not in any order, by the way, lean is used as a short term tactical tool. Okay. The lean initiative isn't connected to the broader strategy of the business, which is a big deal. Functions are optimized for lean, but the enterprise is not, which is a real big deal because you know, when you, Many times when you try to optimize a function, you create dysfunctional uh, results for the rest of the enterprise. And last but not least, leadership is either hands off of lean or reluctant to revisit the basics. And, you know, we got a guy on here called Art Byrne, who probably is the the hallmark, if you will, of hands-on leadership, uh, getting into, you know, I remember hearing the stories about operators going home saying, hey, the CEO taught me 5S today for standard work, right? And you just don't see that right now. So really what what happens, Tom, is that when people call and say, hey, we want to do what Danaher did, or we want to do Lean, or we want to do what Toyota did, whatever, what they really are saying to me for the most part many times is we want their results, (laughs) but they don't want to do the things that you have to do to get those results. And results are only one outcome, right? So... uh, one thing that struck me about this book is that it is um, it's comprehensive and that you share a, a kind of wealth of detailed uh, knowledge and instruction about 
everything ranging from standard work, standard work and process, Hosh and Conry, uh, it just all the kind of tools in the toolbox. And you contextualize this within kind of an enterprise mindset that you really establish how it's more than the tools and practices and that sustaining lean requires a, a complete commitment from top to bottom from every person. And one phrase you use is a level of discipline, which I thought was really interesting because that actually speaks to the attributes that are needed for a company to sustain this work. Um, and finally, there's just this great uh, wealth of experience that you use. You talk a lot about Jake Brake and Danaher. And um, I guess the question is, I'm gonna just skip ahead. Like, wh why is there such a gap today? And I'm gonna ask that first of you, Mark, but we've been introduced to a lot of the big ideas of lean. Um, all three of you have written fantastic books. So what's the gap? Um, and what's standing in the way of closing it? And, and I'm talking about like having the promise of lean more fully realized at a, at a, a ground floor level. Well, well I, let me do the lot. Oh, go ahead, Art. All right, let me, let me jump in on that because, um, you know, I think I agree with, with, with everything that, that Mark said. Um, and my own experience is sort of the same thing, which is, when, when mo most companies look at lean as a cost reduction tool, they just want a cost reduction. That's basically what they want. And they're thinking they, they've come, they've come up to where they are in a traditional way. And so changing things that, that got them there, pretty hard to do. And I know my own experience when I tell people, look, if you really want to do lean, everything has to change. You have to think about sales and marketing. And they look at you and say, sales and marketing, that doesn't got anything to do with lean. And I say, well, look, you know, if you're shipping 50% of your orders in the last week of the month, sales and marketing has a whole lot to do with lean because you, you got to change that. You can't have level loading and one piece flow and all the things that we're trying to do with lean and still think you're going to ship 50% of your sales in the last week of the month. It's never going to happen. And I think the other thing that, you know, if I go back to our early Danaher days, um, you know, one of the things that we learned early on, in fact, the first Kaizen event that we had with Shinjo Jitsu, um, we took a plant tour. This was in Clemson, South Carolina. It was Jacob, Jake Brake's sister company, Jacob's Chuck. And we said, well, well, we'll introduce them to the factory. We'll take them on an hour and a half tour. We got about 100 yards into the factory. They held up their hands and they said, we've seen enough. Let's go back. Went back into the conference room and Mr. Awada gets up on the board in huge letters, he writes, no good. And then he turns around and he looks at us and he says, look, everything here is no good. What do you want to do about it? Now, I would say that for 95, 98% of all companies, if a consultant came in and in two minutes told you that everything here was no good, he would have a fight on his hands. The, 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 you know, the management would say, no, wait a minute, you can't say that. You can't walk in here and say that to us. Um, so they pushed back on it. And in our case, we said, okay, we agree. Show us how to fix it. And, and I think that's a huge difference. That you have to overcome the mentality of, of what you have. And when you get really right down to it, lean is not a cost reduction program. It's a strategy. And it's really kind of a cultural mentality of how you look at the business. How, how does management look at the business? What are you trying to do? And if what you're trying to do is be the best supplier and look at it from a strategic point of view, then you have at least a shot at this stuff. Because the difference is, for example, you know, if the three of us went into any kind of company, what we see and what the existing management sees are completely different. They're just not the same thing at all. And the way that they think is completely different. They've, they've what I say, they've taken their value adding for granted for a long time. In other words, if they have a six week lead time, they've accepted the fact that that can't be changed. And when you talk about what leads to a six week lead time and they'll say, well, 
our setup times are two to three hours. And they've really accepted the fact that that can't change because all their operators and all their functional leaders tell them there's no way you can reduce the setup beyond two or three hours. So once you get locked in on that, the only strategy that you have is to try and make your customers conform to your six week lead time. So all these things are enormous hurdles. Mm -hmm. And you know we, we were able to solve them at Danaher just because we, we looked at it differently. We, you know, we had to do something different and we looked at it differently. We saw lean as a strategy right away. We, we never saw it as a cost reduction program, even though we got huge cost reduction. That, that wasn't why we were doing it at all. It had nothing to do with it. Mm. Uh, Jim, any, any thoughts? Well, I think the, the problem we've all been dealing with is the a lack of Art Burns and the lack of Mark Galuzio's problem, okay? Uh, and I take it the right way, guys, but you're pretty weird. Uh, and I don't know why, why you're so screwed up, but uh, you're pretty weird, okay? And it's very constructively, positively good for civilization weird, but uh, you're outliers. So as Lean came along after, uh, what, say 1990, that uh, the Jake break uh, start, I think was 87. Right. Uh, by the early 90s, uh, and we helped a little bit with MIT with the machine book. Oh, uh, there suddenly was a, a big desire to uh, get some Lean. I'd like to uh, buy some Lean, please. And I've got the scale here and I've got my scoop and I'm gonna scoop out of your bucket uh, some Lean and put it on my scale. And then we'll talk about a price per pound. And also we'll talk about payback because uh, we're hard-headed businessmen and so we want to get paid back. And so the consulting world sort of uh, responded to the customer's uh, want rather than the customer's need. Because in fact, and look, I, I don't, uh, I've got no bad things to say about anybody. Uh, the customer did not want uh, what they needed. So you said, gee, we're not really going to do the heavy lifting. And so the thing we got into uh, was that we would do uh, Kaizen activities that would always produce in the short term a spectacular result. And then we had kind of this hope that if you did enough Kaizen, somehow or other, uh, everything would become aligned and lean. And that was the part that was, uh, hey, that, was that a crazy hypothesis? Uh, hey, I don't know, it's an experiment, run an experiment. But uh, the hypothesis fairly quickly got rejected. And that left us sort of back footed with regard to what do you do? Yeah. And uh, we had actually created a sort of expectation that all there was to lean was just uh, doing five day Kaizans plus some five S. And so uh, that uh, was the problem. That is the problem. Okay. And that's a long term uh, problem that we don't have enough arts and marks. And we got way too many guys who went to business schools and learned how to do functional analysis and uh, listen to Michael Porter about how to be competitive, which is by avoiding competition. And, you know, so we get the, the, the mess we've got. But um, not all is uh, lost. I mean, I think the, the challenge for us right now is to think through uh, what options we might have going forward. And in that regard, Mark's book, uh, which, by the way, everybody should read, uh, less than 100 pages, even a CEO, even a CEO could read this book. Let me just say one more thing that we threw, um, that we were sailing with a tailwind uh, back in the 90s in the manufacturing world. Uh, everybody was scared. And here you've got uh, this foreign competition. And then after the success of the GM Toyota joint venture plant at Numi in 84, uh, people said, holy moly, these Japanese guys can show up here, build plants, and they can beat us here. We thought they could only beat us offshore with cheap labor and tricky whatever they were doing. Uh, now, uh, we've got guys who can actually, on the ground with people like our guys, uh, can play the game as an away game, and they can win. Uh, so that gave us a real boost of people just plain being scared. And uh, back at that time, uh, money still cost something. Remember when you had to pay serious money for money? And so inventory uh, was a big thing. And now, gee whiz, I mean, they're just giving away money down at the treasury. Um, so there were a lot of things that were going on that gave us a, a tailwind that we don't have now, okay? Mm -hmm. And then look, there's always, always 
the distraction of doing these other things that you can just pay for. I mean, how many times have you gone to a company and they said, gee, we'd love to do this lean thing, but we're doing a big ERP implementation. So, hey, how about in three years? Okay. So, okay. And now you've got all this crazy stuff out there with industry 4.0, which is a wonderful excuse for not doing anything. Uh, hey, art uh, catalog shoppers are going to rule the world, catalog engineers, uh, that you can buy so much kit. Uh, and everybody else is buying kit, so you better get some kit. And if you haven't got robots, well, you need some. And if you got some, you need more, and and so on. So there are all these distractions. And uh, by the way, I don't think we've been very successful with social media. Uh, you know, for us old guys, well, it's kind of a foreign land. But uh, that's just another uh, issue behind us that we've got to figure out how to speak a language that uh, the next generation of managers uh, can easily uh, get their heads around. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, your book, uh, Mark, a great sum up of what lean really is versus what people, all the bad habits people learned. And so you just push the reset button and in 90 pages, you say, hey, look, here's what we were talking about. Thank goodness. Somebody did that. But then uh, we still got uh, all of us, uh, those of us are too old to actually be actually in the trenches, but uh, still from an emotional standpoint, I'm really invested in this. I really think this lean stuff makes a better world. And I'm not, uh, I'm not going to give up. But we do have uh, some real practical questions of how we can, um, you know, get people to do now what they weren't willing to do then. And some just didn't understand what they needed to do. But I think, look, Mark, you've been giving good advice to companies for 35 years. And uh, it's not in that book. There were a lot of guys that you have talked that book to over the years. And you're a pretty good talker. And yet you still couldn't get uh, a lot of them to uh, actually give it a serious go. Uh, instead, they said, well, gee, why don't we start and just uh, do some Kaizen over here? So it's, it's look, a challenge. I don't know the answer, but uh, it's the big challenge for us uh, as we think about uh, how to close the gap. Let me, let me uh, jump in with one thing. One, one big takeaway for me about this book was it's, it kind of dynamically captures some of the paradoxes of lean that it, you certainly need um, Kaizen events and point Kaizen, uh, at least as a starting point to get traction, but um, it really, everything seems to rest on the full enterprise approach and um, ownership from the top. And, you know, makes this nice claim, Toyota won the automobile war primarily through Kaizen, which was, I thought, just a nice, graceful um, argument. And, Given all this kind of small and, you know, ground level, high altitude, uh, here's a softball. What, what do you think are the key takeaways and recommendations um, that you are capturing in the book for, that are really essential for company leaders and employees to take to heart to get some traction? With this stuff, you know, I think I think uh, you know Jim touched on it, and so did Art. From the respect, you know, many it, it first comes down to really understanding what this is. Number one, and that's a problem. Okay, that really is a problem, and it's been very convoluted. To Jim's point earlier about all the all the uh, silver bullets that are being out there uh, that are out there today. In my book, I talk about just going back to the freaking basics, right? Standard work, tack time, one piece flow, simple stuff that, by the way, is hard to do, okay? But it's simple. Everybody wants to put up the signboards and the yellow lines on the floor. I have nothing wrong with the yellow lines, but, you know, uh, and, 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 and have a nice shiny plant that doesn't perform, right? And, and so uh, all, the, all the show stuff is what we're looking at. But one of the issues is, I think, that we don't really believe in, and we don't set our compensation systems up either in, an, in accordance with lean thinking, okay? So, so if you, I talk about in the book, uh, the whole mantra of safety, quality, delivery, cost in that order, okay? Each one being higher of importance than the other. And notice that cost is last. To Art's point, this is not a cost reduction program, but if you do all the other ones right, cost falls out of this automatically. It's just a byproduct, right? The problem is there's a maniacal focus on cost and that's wrong because you've got to drive the drivers of cost 
that that will get you the cost that you want. So what ends up happening? Companies lay off 25% of their employees, like a big one just did. Uh, you know, and then just looking at the bottom line. Matter of fact, one of the a big company right now just had a big lean initiative, and they put a guy in charge, and they said, "We are here to really drive our costs." Oh my God, I I said, "Oh, that's so wrong." But when it comes down to really believing what we say in the spirit, let's say of safety, quality, delivery, and cost, we look at. I was just with, believe it or not, I was with a, a CEO a couple about a, a couple months ago. And I asked them, I always ask these questions. I say, what is the biggest problem that you have with your customer? And they said, well, it's lead time. Okay, we're at 20 weeks, but it turned out to be 28, by the way, when we did looked at it. Uh, and the competition's at 12. So I said, well, geez, I said, you know, so your competition sucks too, but you just suck more, right? And, and so, uh, so uh, I said, okay. And so we started talking about that. And uh, then the, about an hour later into the, into the meeting, they started talking about their strategy for outsourcing some of their major components to India, okay? So I said, wait a minute, you've got a domestic customer base. You're gonna move your product 8,000, whatever it is, miles away, okay, to get costs. I don't care if those guys work for zero, okay? It's gonna cost you, and here, here's why it's gonna cost you. So, so, so what I did was I took a chair, I put it in the middle of the conference room. I said, there's your number one customer. I want you now to tell him why it's a good thing for him. After he just got through telling you his lead time is your biggest problem, right? Why is it a good thing for you to move that to India and how, that, how moving to India is gonna be better for him? Please have that conversation with him. And the CEO looked at me and he's a really good guy. He said, I never, I never thought about it that way, okay? I said, okay, well, and when the CFOs, and I used to be one, Art knows I worked for Art as a CFO, uh, when, when CFOs do the math, there's no box on the spreadsheet, no cell on that spreadsheet that says, how much market share are you going to lose because you're going to decimate your lead times? And I asked the CEO, if you can get your lead times to, let's say, three weeks, which I know we can do, okay, what, what, what would that mean for market share? So I'll pick up about 20, 25%. Okay, where's that box as you do the math to go to India? It's not on your spreadsheet, okay? So to Art's point earlier, and Jim, you know, it, this is about profitable growth, not about cost reduction. And these guys are just looking at the cost. And they're saying, hey, you know, some, some CFO is looking at the, the math that says, oh, labor rates are X and we're Y and we're going to save all this great money. And that's not also talking about the 500 guys you send over every year at $25,000 a clip on business class to go check on them and give them their value and their, their wisdom, right? Which yeah. they do nothing. All they do is interfere. Okay. And there's all kinds of other stuff that goes on with this uh, from a lead time, from a, uh, from a customer service perspective, from a quality perspective. And so we just, we don't really believe in the mantra of SQDC. We always gravitate back to cost and we're not really talking the things that, that Art and Jim are talking about, right? They're, they don't really believe it. Okay. Because a lot of these guys are measured, the wrong way. And that is a big problem today, how they're measured from CEO, CEOs all the way down the chain. So one, one of the, one of the things that when I talk to people, I always say, look, you know, you're running a business and what you're trying to do is improve that business. And so you ought to think about a business in a very simplistic way. And my definition is a business is nothing but a bunch of people and a bunch of processes trying to deliver value to a set of customers. There's not anything more than that. And everybody can agree with that until you go to their company. And when you get to their company, they say, well, Art, we, we agree with the theory that you said, but oh, our company is so much more complex and so different and you just don't understand all the problems that we have. And so they've already locked themselves in to all this wrong thinking. And the, the reality is, and I think Mark mentions it in his book, you know, the processes that you have today are going to deliver you the results that you have today. And if you don't change those processes, if you don't focus on that, guess what? Your results are just going to stay the same no matter what you do. And so I, I look at it as, you know, with Lean, we're trying to compete on our operational excellence. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that any company and any CEO has to do is first you need to define what is operational excellence going to be for you? And it's not a bunch of 
KPI type of measurements. It's not things like increased gross margin by three points or some goofy thing like that. It's what I call driver measures, the things that you think if you do these things over the next five or 10 years, you will have a completely different company. And these measurements will drive your results. They're not measuring the results. The results are results. But if I measure what, what I think drives that, you're going to start to get that. And what we did at, at uh, Wiremold, um, for example, we had five, we ran the whole company on five things. First one was 100% on-time customer service, not 98.4 or 99.4, but 100. And we, we just said, we're not going to stop till we get to 100. And we said, we want to have a 50% reduction in defects every year. We want to have a 20% gain in productivity every year. Um, we want to have 20 inventory turns as our first target. We, we were at three, by the way. So, of course, everybody said, oh, my God, you're out of your mind. Um, and then we said we want to have the 5S and visual control every place. So those are all, those are all drivers. They're all, but they're all stretch goals. And they're all things that are stretch goals on purpose to make you think differently. Because if I just said, I want you to go from three times inventory turns to five, it's pretty easy for most people to say, well, we can go from three to five. We'll just do what we're doing now a little bit better and we'll get to five. But if you want me to go to 20, that's nuts. I, I, don't, I don't get that, right? I don't understand 20. So if, once you have these, if you have these operational excellence goals, the next thing is how do I get everybody focused around these goals? Well, you can't do it and stay in a functional organization where you know all the punch presses are together and all the drilling machines are together and all the lays are together. You know, we, I think we do that because we think that machines are happier when they're near each other, other machines just like them, which is a kind of stupid thing, but that's what everybody does. But you know, if if you if you if you, once you have these goals, you got to deploy them down into your organization. The only way to do that is you got to change the functional structure, mm -hmm. and you got to go from functional organization to a value stream organization. And once, once you get into a value stream organization, now you can say every value stream leader, the only thing we want you to do is focus on getting to these five things. And then what we did is we said, once we had those two things together, we said, we're gonna run the company based on that. We're gonna stop doing these crazy end of month reviews because we're reviewing something that already happened. And, and because we couldn't close the books for three weeks, it already happened three weeks ago. Nothing we can do about it now. Instead, we said every week, all the value stream leaders have to come in and present to myself and my senior management team how they're doing on these five things. They had 10 minutes to do it. They had to tell us how they were doing, and they had to tell us what they're going to do next week to improve, period. That's all we wanted to hear. We were there not to criticize, but to help them. If somebody was falling behind, we would assign the Kaizen promotion office in there to help them. Yeah. But the whole drive of everybody all the time was just these five things, right? And sometimes people say, well, all right, five things, that's a lot. What, what if you could only do two things? Which ones would you pick? And I say, oh, that's pretty simple. You would pick 100% on-time customer service because that's why you're in business, right? You're trying to you know, do a little more value to the customer. And the second thing you would pick would be inventory turns. And people look at you like, what, what are you talking about? Why would you pick inventory turns? Well, because if I can have inventory turns going up and customer service improving, everything else has to fall in line. I have to have good quality. I have to have good productivity. I have to have all the other things happening in order for those two things to happen. So if you make it simple and you have simple things you're trying to drive and you make sure that the, the goals that you set are stretch goals, because stretch goals, to me, stretch goals represent the Toyota respect for people principle. Because by having stretched goals, what you're really saying is, I believe that my people can, can do extraordinary things if we give them the right targets and assist them in learning how to implement those. As opposed to, you know, most people say, oh, I can't, I can't give my people those kind of stretched goals. They'll, I'll lose them. They'll, they'll, won't, they'll just go away. They won't, they'll think it's impossible. So it's the reverse. But if you keep it simple like that, I think you can make real progress on this. Getting people to do it. Hey, Art, Art, you know, you know the respect for people principle. You know, did a lot of studying on that. You know, but one of the biggest problems with the respect for people principle, or I should say, adopting it, is that 
so many companies or leaders, I should say, do not know they're disrespecting people. And, yeah. and you know, you go back to Ono saying, you know, no problem is problem. That usually is the biggest problem in that regard. It's not what they're doing. It's they don't even know they're doing it or even recognize that it's a, a problem. Okay. And so that is uh, probably the, if you want, if, Tom, if you're looking for the biggest reason why mm -hmm. this fails, that's probably it right there. Okay. Yeah. I, so. I have to share a little story. I went with Art on a visit to a local hospital once. And we're at the Gemba and Art's looking at this uh, chart of how long it takes to um, prepare a machine uh, to turn it over. And it took a long time. And Art stood there and he said, very, I thought very respectfully, why does it take so long? And I thought that was a valid question. And the folks who led the tour afterwards said, you know, that was a little shocking. The nurses felt uh, disrespected. And I never saw that, not, not defending you, Art. I didn't see it, but I think it's one of these dynamics, these kind of creative, these tensions in, in making lean operational that it's, it's, it's hard stuff. If, if, you want, if you want to make change, I really do believe after all these years of doing this, you have to, you have to, um, uh, expect that you're going to disre that you're going to you're going to you know you're going to challenge people. You you cannot be afraid to um, to to not offend somebody. Okay, and you don't mean to, and you want to be respectful, but people will get re offended like they did with art because you're calling out the you know you're calling them out on it, and 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 that is a problem. Now, I will say that when we started in uh, 87 with Shinga Jitsu, and I was there at the time, we got the crap beat out of us from them. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and you want to know something? I remember this. I remember saying, you know, beat me again. I love it, you know, because, and, and now today though, I think we have become very soft and, and very sensitive, okay? I mean, some of the things that we went through, Art and I went through with Shin, Shinga Jitsu, Nakao and Iwata, oh my God. I mean, for, how many times do you get fired, Art? I yeah. got fired a million times, okay? They kept firing me back, sometimes five times a day, right? Uh, be, be called cement head and concrete head and, and, you know, and I mean, they were tough, okay? And, and but you know, we looked at that and we knew that if they were doing that with us, they, want, they really respected us, that they wanted, they knew that we could do this. That's how we looked at it, right? Today, if you tried that stuff today, forget it, forget I it. I gotta say, like, so I've seen Dr. Womack in action. I mean, Jim, I know you, you've been to 8 million Gembas. And one of your consistent qualities is truth, that you really tell people what you see. And I think that that's um, prompted productive change. And I, I, I guess it seems to me one, another takeaway from the book is that you're trying to foment organizational mindfulness, you know, that, that it's just trying to produce an awareness of, of, of how things are running and where they're not running well. Um, but, uh, I mean, Jim, what do you think about this notion of lean succeeding um, through, I guess, confrontation? If that's well, it depends on, um, all depends on how you do it, Tom. That, uh, don't forget, I was in a different uh, position uh, from Mark uh, post uh, Danaher, that I was never there as the uh, consultant who was actually going to make them do something. <laughs> I was simply there as uh, the great uh, wizard uh, who was going to be there for a day, and as soon as we get rid of this guy, we can go back and do nothing. <laughs> and you get a little bit different reaction. People might be offended, but it's just different uh, that I wasn't the one who was going to say, by the way, you know, we really got to do this. So why don't we start right now? Uh, and that's so uh, therefore uh, you're, you're, my, my uh, job was easier. I was just trying to raise consciousness, but I was not trying to say, hey, look, we can do this uh, and we are going to do this and we're going to do it right now. And that was the, uh, the gift of the Shingy guys that uh, certainly they were very abrasive. But uh, they were also, uh, I think, universally recognized to be very smart. 
But uh, they also, their sort of attitude as they were standing there was, well, we're going to do this. <laughs> and uh, by the way, the, the, tr the fact of the matter is with the Shingi guys, um, that um, if they didn't respect you, they just walked out. They said, look, this is hopeless. You know, we're, we're going to do that. By the way, I went, I, this is just for, uh, that uh, Mark and Art would appreciate this, but I went with a WADA to a Denso plant in Japan, a uh, totally automated Denso car parts plant. And we walked in and we were supposed to go see the, uh, the, you know, the head of the operation. And we walked in about 50 yards and Iwata turns to me and says, these guys are Germans. It's all about machines. I can't help them, we're leaving. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. Uh, here, here was a case where instead of calling them cement heads, he just said, this is so hopeless. I'm just out of here. This is a totally different mentality. So there, look, there are a lot of different ways that you can try to promote change. Uh, some people can do it from being uh, Mr. Sweetie Pie. Uh, yes, we can, let me give you a hug. Other people can do it with tough love. Uh, other people, everybody has to develop their own uh, way that you can uh, get the person who doesn't really want to do something to do it, but there are ways. Uh, look, I think our movement has not been so weak uh, on that uh, as it's been trying to find somebody to talk to. And Art said something very interesting a few minutes ago about he would call the line leaders in every week and he had his five things he wanted to ask them about. And by the way, he wasn't asking about their number. He was saying, how are you going to improve your number? I don't care about your number. I want you to tell me how you are going to improve the number. Now we also call those folks uh, value stream managers. And uh, in American practice, uh, those folks hardly exist that line managers uh, think their job is to keep score, to do annual reviews, to explain variances, to, if necessary themselves, but probably won't be necessary, drive the fire truck to deal with all the things that have gone wrong today. Uh, the fact that they themselves would have to actually understand their process and they would have to actually engage with their superiors in a discussion of how to improve their process this is not, you know, hope is a plan. Uh, we're not talking about hope here. We're talking about what are you going to do? And we've created a whole continent and a whole generation of managers who don't know anything about their process right. and who basically think they're there to call some consultant or some uh, team uh, to come in and do what Toyota would say is their work, right? And so that's just a major problem. If you're in the consulting business, uh, what you desperately want, I think, I mean, hey, Mark, I'm just saying, you, you just want somebody to talk to who's actually going to take responsibility. You know, not delegate responsibility, but take responsibility. So there's a whole culture there that uh, it's, uh, you know, it's hard for us to, to work around, but we keep trying. We had, we had a, uh, we've had a lot of good successes over the years. Uh, unfortunately, I wish those successes were higher in terms of, you know, a rate of success, but there have been a lot of really good successes. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's sustainability is a, is a real issue. But, you know, you, you made a good point, Jim, on, on rate of improvement, because in, in Art2, uh, on his on his team meetings, you know, I used to get in a, into uh, people at Danner would come up to me and they, they would say to me, um, hey, Mark, what's a world-class benchmark for, you know, inventory turns or, product, you know, whatever. And I said, look, I'm not going to sit here and argue with you about a number, okay? I don't know what the number is. And I can guarantee you by the time, whatever it is, and if we agree, by the time you get there, it will be changed, okay? Number one. And number two, you're not world-class. So get your ass back to work, okay? Because you're just not it. So, so I think the important thing is the rate of improvement, okay? The rate. Art talked about 50%, okay? Uh, and that we learned that from the Japanese. They said at minimum, by the way, we look at quality improvements, not 3%, not 8%, at minimum 50. And I, 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 I say the same thing about lead time, set up, everything else, right? And, and uh, it's interesting, and not, to, not to invoke Six Sigma, but if you are at, let's say 50,000 parts per million, and you only improve 50% per year, I think if you do the math, it's something like 13 or 14 years to get to Six Sigma, okay? Uh, so you don't have that kind of time. You've got to do more than 50, right? And it was interesting, this invoking Six Sigma, 
I remember, I think it was a water gym that told me six Sigma, no good. 3.4 parts per million. Why do you accept that? Why not? Why aren't you thinking about zero? 3.4, no good. And, and, you know, you do the math on airplanes and I got this in my book. I did the math on this. And if the airlines flew at six Sigma, we'd have a crash every three days. Okay. So, so they could not understand why we would accept 3.4. As a, it was a, more of a, a mentality, just like when Art said, why are you planning 99%? You're, you're planning to fail 1% of the time. Why are you doing that? Why, why is that a good thing? You know, so it's all a mentality. I'm talking about thing, mentality. You know? One of the things that I think helped us a lot in the early days at Danaher was when we first started working with Shin Jiu Jitsu, of course, as Mark said, they were calling us names. They were throwing things around. That was They were really tough, really hard to deal with. Myself and uh, George Konensaker, and we were the two that kind of started this thing and, and Dan and her to begin with, we, we both thought strategically about things. And we said, this is the greatest strategic weapon we've ever seen. We didn't ever, never, ever, ever start as a cost reduction. So we said, look, let's make a pact. Whatever Shin Jiu Jitsu tells us to do, we're going to do it, even if we think it's the stupidest thing we ever heard. And I would say about half the time, we thought it was the stupidest thing we ever heard. But we said, we're going to do it, and we're going to learn from it. And the one thing we're going to make sure is, once we do it, we're never going to let it go back to what it was before. Because your, your local management team, you know, most of the time it would fail. We couldn't get it to work because we'd build a cell, but we had never maintained the equipment before. And so you build a cell where one machine is dependent upon the other, and because you never maintained it, some machine breaks down, the whole cell dies, right? Um, so your, your, your management team is saying, let's go back the way we were before. We can't, we can't keep this up. And we just said, no, we're never gonna let you go backwards. We're gonna fix this. We're gonna figure out what's wrong. We're gonna fix it and we're gonna go forward. And I think just having that mentality and that determination that says, never let it go backwards, fix the problem, take the next step, that was a big reason why Danaher and then eventually Wiremold and other places have been successful because we, we didn't let it go back. We just said, we're not gonna do that. We're, we're gonna listen. If they're telling us something, they're telling us for a reason. And we never found something that they told us that once we did it and understood it, we said, okay, now we get it. We understand why they wanted to do that. <laughs> Tom, can I just, uh, I wanna uh, end on, a, on, a, on an optimistic note. Please. Uh, found some things we could do. And one uh, request, I, hmm? uh, I would love that, Jim, and I'm also going to ask each of you to end, and you'll take the first part, add yeah. to it any bullet points, recommendations you have um, a, as we move forward, and let's establish as the goal a gap in current lean practice and understanding and more sustained success. Yeah. Period and and what well, recommendations you might have, but please. Well, look, let's just uh, recommend call. three things. Uh, I've gotten a lot of calls in the last year or two from the early adopters, from companies way back when, that said we're going to do this, and what that ended up meaning was they have an operational excellence or a lean team that's been working for nearly 30 years, and they're doing still point kaizen and called up and said, gee, you know, uh, I feel flatlined. And so therefore, what do we do? Well, uh, read Mark's book, okay? And I do think there's some willingness of these folks who are still sympathetic to the ideas. They honestly just don't know how to do them. Okay. I almost feel like I ought to make a list of all of those companies, uh, see if they'd be willing to get together and talk about uh, what they need to do now. So that's one thing. That's Second, uh, the folks are trying to bring some manufacturing back. Um, that uh, we think that's a good thing, bring some manufacturing back. But wait a minute, do it the lean way rather than the crappy way you were doing it when you left. And I think there's a real opportunity there. We've had an interesting experience with GE Appliances that had so hollowed out uh, Appliance Park in Louisville that there was no there there. The lights were on, but nobody was home. And uh, they decided uh, for various reasons to bring it back and discovered, by the way, that they couldn't even do it the old way. They no longer knew how. All of the old mass production guys were gone. And it turned out, actually, they couldn't make anything. They just didn't know anything about manufacturing. And so we've had a lot of fun, not as their consultants, but as their uh, thought partners. Uh, and by the way, they've just done some amazing, great stuff. 
but there are lots of other companies out there. And you say, gee, guys, before you come back with some manufacturing and do it the same crummy way you did it before you left, why don't we have a talk? And then third thought, uh, we've never made this connection, which is between the product development and production, and in particular, process development. So that when I could travel, that was back until the beginning of March, I would routinely see relatively new processes in companies that were totally wrong. And yet this company had said they were going to do lean. And you say, what happened, guys? This is the wrong technology and the wrong product design. And what happened? And the answer was, well, basically, we just never talked because it's hard. So I think completing that handshake uh, in which you get the product and process development. Okay, don't ever let yourself say product development. It is product and process development. Every product has to have a process to get the value to the customer. Um, I think we could, uh, you know, we could have a conversation now that uh, maybe we couldn't have before. So those are three things that I've been looking at, thinking about as opportunities to uh, get ourselves uh, elevated up to the level that uh, Mark describes in the book. And that would be good for the country. It would be good for companies. It would be good for employees. It would just be good all around. Tim, you make a point about the, you know, when people go to visit Toyota, they don't really understand that a lot of the brilliance that they see in, in, man, in their manufacturing is a byproduct of the design, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that is, a lot of people don't understand that and, and, and how that ties in. And uh, all they see is the, you know, and, and to me, the, the definition of genius is taking the complex and making it simple. And that's what they've done, you know. But they did that a lot through design, both process and product. And so it's a, it's a really good point that I think a lot of people miss. Well, I, I can go if you want. And then no, maybe I'm going to, I'm going to ask Art to go. I'm going to okay. let you be the final word because you are okay. the uh, author of uh, Flatlined. And uh, I'll correct everything Art said. Is that what you want me to do? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> That's fine with me. <laughs> no, I, I think, you know, this is, this has always been the, uh, the most difficult question of all with lean is how do you get people interested in doing this stuff in the first place. And even if you get them interested, how do you get them to understand what this really is? Because 95, more than 95% just look at it as cost reduction. Because when they look at the results of a Jake break or a wire mold or other companies that have been very successful, the thing they focus on is cost reduction. They don't focus on, on the customer service part. They don't focus on short lead times and, and the fact that lean is really, I think of it as a time-based growth strategy because what it does really is every time you remove waste, you shorten the time it takes to do anything. And I, I always like to use a, a, simple, a simple example because a lot of times people say, well, lean is not strategic. The, the, the people will argue with you up and down all the time about that's not strategic, it's just cost reduction. And it's just something we should give to operations and nobody else has to do it. And, but if you think about something like setup reduction, um, you know, if you've got two companies, A and B, and they both buy the same equipment from the same manufacturer, so it runs at the same speeds and all those kind of things. And the only difference is company B figures out how to change the machine over in one minute, and company A takes an hour. And then you say, okay, and if they can only, if they can each only do I dedicate one hour a day for changeover time because they got to make product the rest of the time. You just ask yourself this couple of questions. Who, who would have the lowest cost? The guy who changes in an hour or the guy who changes in a minute, right? This is confusing for a guy who thinks traditionally. It's very confusing. That doesn't make any sense to them, right? But the reality is, and you can point it out in lots of different examples, but the guy who can change in a minute is going to have an enormous cost advantage over the guy who takes an hour. And then the next question is, if they only each can have an hour or a day of setup time, who has the best customer service? They say, well, gee, the guy that can change in an hour and he only has one hour a day, that means he can only make two different products a day, the one before the setup and the one after. The guy who can change in a minute, however, he can make 61 different products a day, the one before the setup and 60 changeovers. So he's gonna have a huge advantage in customer service and he's going to have a huge advantage in lean time. So you say, well, gee, if all I did was setup reduction, 
but I got the lowest cost, the best customer service, and the shortest lead time. I think that's pretty damn strategic, right? I think it's a very strategic thing. If we could get more people to understand lean and what you're trying to do in those kind of simplistic ways, even though you're talking about something that they look at it as, oh, that's a manufacturing thing to set up stuff. Um, but if you can get people to understand that and to understand that it's time-based growth strategy, not a cost reduction program, I, I think then we could make some progress. And I'm hoping that, you know, that this is as bad as this pandemic thing is, there's a lot of companies that if they don't make a change now, then it's going to go away. And that's a great motivator to try something very different than you've done before. So I'm very hopeful that a lot of companies, when they're in these dire straits, will say, look, I can't keep doing what I was doing before without going out of business. Let's try lean. Because in my experience, the company that's organized traditionally and by function, they have something like 25 to 40% too many people. They have about 50% too much space. They have five to six times more inventory than they need, which is what's taken up all this extra space. And their lead times are 10 to 20 times longer than what a lean company has. So, you know, if, if you can start to understand that just your organizational structure, your functional organizational structure mm -hmm. creates those kind of problems, uh, you know, and, and start from that, I think that maybe you have a chance of at least saying, well, let's try this stuff. Let's give it a try. So, you know, maybe a couple of simple things like that will work. Excellent. Um, Mark, please, uh, please share your final thoughts and we will Okay, wrap. well, final thoughts. First of all, Tom, thanks for getting us all together. I really appreciate it. And uh, I haven't seen Jim in a while, so it's good to see Jim. Uh, and uh, Art, I just saw about a month ago in Boston. He made me buy him dinner, by the way, just to let you know. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I think I owe him a couple more dinners too. So uh, I'll pay up, don't worry. Uh, and uh, so I think uh, maybe there's a lot to say here, but I, I think I think I'll leave you a, a couple three 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 key things to think about. One is it's really important to, for for executives in particular to know that there is no silver bullet. Okay, uh, it's you know I, I use the analogy of you know you go down to let's say Lowe's or Home Depot and you buy a refrigerator, you bring it home, you plug it in. And 20 minutes later, you have cold drinks. It doesn't work that way. We want DBS, like Jim said, you know, I want, I want a, a, a bucket of lean, right? There's no silver bullet in the problem in our industry, my industry in consulting, there's just too many freaking silver bullets out there that everybody is getting confused on, whether it's TOC, whether it's Six Sigma, Lean Sigma, whatever the hell that is. Um, and, and so, um, so there's a lot of stuff out there today that's really confusing the hell out of people, right? Number one. Number two is, I really stress the basics, and I think that's what Art's been talking about all along. And, and I don't know how many companies that say they've been doing lean for 10 years, and I go in, and the first thing I ask for is, where's your standard work combination sheet? Well, we don't do standard work. You have to understand we're different, okay? Uh, so it's all fake lean. They've got the poster boards up. They've got the lines on the floor. They've got the Gemba walks, which are meaningless, by the way, because nobody knows how to do a Gemba walk. Uh, but they go through the motion and waste everybody's time in the morning. And what they turn into is expediting meetings rather than real Gemba walks. And then they mark themselves green because they outproduced the demand from the day before. And it's like, well, why'd you do that? Because we had a good day. We beat our plan. Well, what are you going to do with the inventory? You know, just stuff like that, right? Uh, and, and so, uh, so we do a lot of fake lean, but the basics, if you go back just to the Toyota production system house and look at the bottom, there are three things there, Kaizen, high level scheduling and standard work. I remember Nicole telling me, if you don't understand standard work, you do not understand the Toyota production system. He said that. Okay. Now, as far as Kaizen goes, how many, how many Kaizens are you doing? We're doing one a week, uh, one a month or one a quarter, I should say. And it's like, okay, so you're aspiring to be Mr. Universe, but you're going to go to the gym once a, once, a, once a quarter. Okay, I got that. All right, that makes a lot of sense. Oh, by the way, really nice poster boards that you put up, right? Uh, so it's fake lean. We're not doing the basics. Okay, number one. Number two, uh, I've had, I have had companies tell me we can't use tack time because whatever we make, we can sell. So we don't really need to do tack time. Well, then why are you turning inventory 1.8 times? Okay. Sell that stuff first, right? 
And then last but not least, when it comes to how we run our lives versus how we run our companies, they're drastically different. And a lot of it has to do with our measurement system, okay? But I'll give you a couple examples. So I was with a, a CFO and a CEO of a company down in Arkansas walking through their plant. And I said to the CFO, how do you pay, pay people here? Everybody gets measured and compensated on utilization of equipment. I go, that's great. So they weren't changing over, okay, like Art says, because that shut their number down, right? They're making stuff. They're making A when they had orders for B. Um, they weren't doing even preventive, never mind TPM, but preventive maintenance, okay, because that took time away from their measure. So I said to the, I said to the, uh, I said, why do you do that? And the CFO said, we're trying to, we paid a lot of money for this equipment. We're trying to get our money, our, our, our return back, our investment back. I said, okay, that's interesting. I said, hey, by the way, you have a new car, right? He goes, yeah. I said, uh, uh, it's a Lexus, right? I said, he's bought a Toyota, right? And uh, he says, yeah, I have a Lexus. I said, well, you paid a lot of money for that, right? Oh, yeah, it's pretty expensive. I said, okay, well, are you going to drive it around the block tonight a thousand times to get utilization on it? Well, I wouldn't do that. Well, why won't you do it? Well, what the hell you don't? Why are you having these guys do that, okay? Why would you not do that? If it's a good idea here, it should be a good idea for you too, right? Another example is they couldn't understand what Art said about doing multiple changeovers, okay? They were, they were looking at um, less changeovers or changeover avoidance, okay? And, and so they couldn't understand. And I said, okay, look, I said, how many of you guys, and again, I would like to relate it back to real life, right? How many of you guys ever had a barbecue in your backyard? Friends and family. Everybody raises their hands. I said, okay, let's say you're serving hot dogs and hamburgers. How many people just make hot dogs? Then later you're going to make the hamburgers. Nobody raised their hand. I said, well, why not? And they said, well, you know, geez, you know, there are people that want hot dogs and there are people like that want hamburgers. I want them all to eat at the same time. I said, well, okay, if your machine, let's say, makes 10 parts, do your customers only order part one? Because you decide to make it in the first week and change over on Saturday, regardless of volume. Uh, or, 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 and then maybe part two, they order, you just happen to consume it the same time you decide to manufacture it in week two. Oh, no. Well, you don't do it with hot dogs and hamburgers. Why are you doing it in your production? So, we, you know, we took, we took one thermal forming process down by 72% in, the, in one week, by the way. And they were now able to make all 12 parts every 1.2 days with a setup wheel. Art knows what I'm talking about. And, and we got to do, we got to do, you know, 12 changeovers in every 1.2 days. Yeah. I said, yeah, 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 you do. Okay. And, 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 and just like, you're not going to just serve hot dogs and then hamburgers. Right. So they got it. They understood it. But, you know, always going back to real life, we won't go out and buy eight months worth of inventory of groceries because we got a deal on it, okay? We also wouldn't shop, if I live in Chicago, do grocery shopping in LA because I can get a cheaper price. But we go to India, we go to China, right? So if you think about how we live our lives and then apply that methodology and that thinking to our business, I think we'll be a lot better off, okay? Because we pretty much do live a pretty lean life the way we, we run our own, own pocketbook. But when it's somebody else's money, it's a different game. Okay. And then our compensation system gets in the way too. So I'll leave you with all that, all that thought process. There's a lot more to talk about, but uh, those are the things that I think, uh, you know, if, if people just get back to basics and, and, and know that this is a lot of hard work, but it's also a lot of fun work too. It's fun. It's hard and it's worth it. That's the bottom line is it's worth it. And uh, so, you know, we don't want to use this as I will not work with a, a CEO who, whose main reason is to, reduce headcount. I will not do that. I, I'll just refuse to work with them, right? Uh, you know, lean, L-E-A-N, uh, a lot of the, the, the black eye it's gotten was less employees are needed, L-E-A-N, right? And I will not work with, that's not why we do lean, okay? We, to our point, we use it as a strategy to grow the business, right? And take share and, 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 and compete, even in a commodity business, we can compete with lead time and quality and kick the crap and even get price out of a commodity believe it or not okay we've done that all right so you know if you've got that as a competitive weapon who's gonna stop you you know so anyway i'll stop there but that's that's kind of my my thoughts on that as we as we as we wrap up here but i really thank you for having me uh 
on this and uh, to be in the presence of these these two guys, which is phenomenal. So thank you. This is fantastic. I really want to just give the biggest, great, most gracious thank you. Um, we have had Jim Womack, who's written many books and who actually wrote the foreword to Art Burns books. Art has, Byrne has written two books and has written the foreword to Mark Deluzio's book. Um, and Mark's new book, once again, is Flatlined. And uh, we all really highly recommend it. So thank you all. And uh, here's to more conversations. Thanks, Tom. Hey, see yeah. you, guys. See Thanks, ya. Art. Thanks, Jim. Right. Thank you, Mark, Art, and Jim, for great conversation. Please remember that Mark's new book is titled Flatlined, Why Lean Transformations Fail and What to Do About It. Special thanks for production support for this podcast to Pat Pancheck and to Lori Moniz. And the biggest thanks are to you, our listener. Please share any thoughts, comments, questions, or suggestions for improvement to us at pod, P-O-D, at lean.org. Thank you.